Are the current ideas about prevention sufficient for a next pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it's, so there's a lot that is known, but that is ignored or denied by the public health apparatus. Um, that's one thing. So, you know, what it, what's included in current ideas? And then the other thing is what's the nature of the pathogen in the next pandemic? So as we talked about briefly in the first hour, two hours, whatever it was, um, you know, what we know, some things are likely to be having sufficient vitamin D levels is going to be healthy for you and good at um, predicting a robust immune response for you as an individual regardless of pathogen. But there are some pathogens for which it will matter less, right? Yeah. But, and go on. Well, I was just going to say the upshot is that for a large number of pathogens known and unknown, were you to engage in a proactive campaign to get people aware of vitamin D, how it is normally produced, what you do if you're deficient, how likely it is that you are deficient, Yes. were you to blanket the world with that information so that people could correct their own deficiencies, a great many pathogens that might otherwise spread will find their R-naughts below one and will not get a foothold, right? Yep. So what kind of knowledge is that? It's knowledge about, hmm. you know, you may never know that there was going to be a pandemic. If you did that thing, you might have something that would have been a pandemic, but for your proactive thing, and you'll never get credit for having prevented it. Well, and this, I mean, this is unfortunately one of the problems with public health, right? That uh, the best public health policies and practitioners never know that what they did worked. And, and the incentive it, it, structure doesn't. And doesn't so, work you know, it. it's much more impressive to come in to chaos. And, and appear to solve a problem than to avert the problem in the first place. Because if you avert the problem in the first place, others can legitimately say, how do you know you averted it? You don't know you averted it. Maybe it just wasn't going to happen. And that does, and that does make preventative measures hard to assess, right? If they're actually done in advance, if they're actually prophylactic. But, um, but vitamin D is so widely understood to have so many uh, beneficial effects in the body, uh, that that would, you know, I think that we would see, ah, well, so it doesn't require any new pathogens. We would see the prediction I'm happy to make, and I'm not the first one at all to make, is that if the world got a hold of its vitamin D levels, that we would have a reduction in cold and flu in the winter, in, you know, in November through March in the Northern Hemisphere and the the southern winter as well and the and the relevant months there yeah uh, no, I, i've heard uh, ryan cole say mm. and it may be a slight exaggeration but I, I don't think so there is no cold or flu season there's vitamin d deficiency season right right um, so you know other ideas about prevention part of part of the problem you know the the, the party line solutions have so many drawbacks, have so many negatives that no one is talking about. And, you know, that we talked about some with regard to, to masking in the first, in the first hour. Uh, but the, the lack of touch, the lack of, uh, of just even, you know, the lack of serendipity and just, you know, like this is so trivial, but just like being able to walk through it early, early in the pandemic, that whole first summer, Northern Hemisphere summer here in Portland, the farmer's markets, which I used to love and just stopped going to them, once they reopened, you had to walk in a particular place. There were only a certain number of people who walk in at this open air market, right? Like walk in, and then there were arrows and you could only go clockwise or counterclockwise. You could only go this, that, and the other. It's like, that's not <clears throat> the whole, the whole idea here is, oh, that looks interesting. Oh, I wonder if that guy's peaches are better than hers. Oh, oh, I do want some, some strawberries today and oh you're going to walk in lockstep around this farmer's market well that's not interesting in any way and um and it's not it's not good for the human psyche it's not good for the vendors at these places and the social distancing the partitions between people like literal partitions and the fact that we're you know mostly seeing each other through screens would some are, would some of those measures? I think the farmers market thing was just stupid entirely. But um, were some of those measures effective against? Would some of those measures have been effective against some kinds of respiratory viruses? Probably, but at what cost? And when do we get to start um, addressing the other side of the equation? Because preventing the next pandemic at the cost of 
two years of madness and mayhem and chaos in which the disparity in wealth and well-being in the world just got far more extreme than it was before, that wasn't worth it. Yeah, but uh, A, I think we are partially downstream from a sales pitch about how likely um, these pandemics are. Yep. And, you know, this is like the perfect storm of awful, right? You had um, salesmen behind the scenes pitching the idea that we absolutely had to find the most dangerous pathogens we could and turbocharge them as quickly as possible so that we would be ready if they ever leapt out of a cage of their, uh, the cave of their own accord, which was nonsense. Of course, it so, turns out a cage. <laughs> number one, yeah. Number one thing to do to prevent the next pandemic is get a hold of these nitwits and keep them away from power and money. Yes. And, you know, notice that it's not like this was a secret. We had a battle in 2015 over mm -hmm. whether or not the gain of function uh, research program was itself the hazard to planet Earth. Legislatively, we did the right thing. And then uh, again, that snake oil salesman overrode the gain of function ban and offshored the work. So yep. you need to get a hold of your political corruption problem <laughs> if you want to prevent the next pandemic, because the most likely place for your next pandemic to come from is the nitwits, nitwits with their sales pitch about turbocharging viruses. Yep. But um, the other thing which I proposed at the beginning of all of this mm -hmm. was that we ought to be studying and I, people will say we already are. I don't believe them. We need to be studying the way normal pathogens actually work, right? We need to have a, yes. an institute that is freed from corruption that studies how normal things like colds and flu and other uh, viruses actually transmit and behave and evolve. And we do this haphazardly. But if mm -hmm. we did it so that, you know, we started tracking variants of the common cold as they actually spread across the globe and figured out what measures actually did function at minimal disruption, right? And then the other, the third part of this is at the beginning of the pandemic, we started to have the first decent conversations in public about uh, how things are transmitted, Yep. right? The fact that people began to understand fomite transmission, they began to understand that they might be wiping things into their eyes that would then make them sick, right? That conversation was healthy. Mm -hmm. The fact that it took COVID to have us having a conversation, that conversation. about getting conscious about whether or not you're touching your face. Yeah. Right. All mm -hmm. of these things are important. And so the point is, A, we need people who are not in the business of lying to study the question of how things are transmitted, even normal, mundane, everyday things that are not important to control like colds right? In order that they can take that knowledge and map it onto things that are important to control. Mm -hmm. So we need to prevent ourselves from releasing these things. We need to understand how the transmission uh, works so that we can uh, learn from the mundane stuff for the stuff that actually does need to be controlled. And then we need to educate the public, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, it's as important in school that you study the question of how these things are transmitted you know, as it is that you study, I don't know, the capitals of the various states or whatever other nonsense we waste <laughs> kids' time on, right? Just, yeah. This is the kind of knowledge that will actually save weeks of your life from being compromised by pathogens if you just simply understand where you're in danger of contacting them and how you can alter your behavior to reduce the chances that you do, right? If you could reduce the number of colds and flus that you had in a lifetime by 20%, how much education would that be worth? You know? It's a lot. Yeah. And uh, you would be teaching students how to think through systems and come to conclusions that aren't, uh, th that aren't just about memorization. Unlike, you know, your example of the state capitals is both a stereotype and still true, I think, and a very good one. It's very easy to teach that sort of thing because you're either right or you're wrong. If we're going to go into memorization territory, let's at least make it math, right? right. Like, let, you know, at least, at least with like, there are some things and, you know, just basic, basic, basic arithmetic things like your times tables um, that you should know. And that is a memory thing. Like, yeah, you can derive it each time, but that's going to take a while. So why not just memorize it? And um, yeah, there's a lot of things that most people who actually have a lot to say about a lot of things do have that they can pull from memory. 
But uh, memory is not the thing. Memory is not the main thing. And what you want to, you know, have is, you know, an architecture in your head of like what's connected to what. So you can say, oh, well, I don't, I, I can't pull that fact up, but I can connect it to this, to this, to this, to this, and there it is, right? And, you know, the state capitals have the virtue, which is to say not a virtue at all, of being, you know, very easy to assess for a teacher. You're like, you either, you either got, got it or you didn't. It's Sacramento or it's not, right? Um, but there's no dev- devising it that you could possibly do. You cannot derive by first principles what the capital of any state is. You might have a memory associated with a thing. You might have a mnemonic, but a mnemonic's another cheat and it's taken up more brain space. And, you know, it is useful that I still know most, not all by any means, <laughs> of the state capitals, kind of. I think it would be more useful that I knew for sure. And I, like, I'm my dad did a lot of maps with me. I know a lot of geography, most more than most Americans. But um, it would have been much more important to learn uh, fifty the locations and borders of fifty countries that most Americans don't know, or even the most Americans do know than the capitals of the 50 states. Sure, start with the 50 states themselves, but then go to the capitals? No. Do something more interesting, more important, more global. And we're still all in like, you can't derive from first principles territory. And I'd rather see more math if you're going to do memorization. And then I'd really rather see more, okay, if you start with A and B, what do you need? Like, what would you have to know in order to also know whether C was true? Something like that. Yep. I do think you can derive Washington State's capital from first principles, but it might be the only one. Washington State's capital? Mm-hmm. Really? I think so. You wouldn't know the name, but it kind of has to be right at the bottom of the Puget Sound, right? Because that's where the stuff, the logs, get to the water in the first place that it's deep enough to take them to the Pacific. So you would... You would I mean, the first place, depending on where you're starting, but Seattle would have been just as fine a, a, a choice. And in fact, well, I think I guess Seattle the, was. The point is for anything south, anything coming up. That's a, that's a lot of epicycles. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't use epicycles. I would use trucks. Yeah. And then, um, trucks when, when the state of Washington was being. Well, decided. all right. Trains. I see. Mm-hmm. 